Welcome to today's speaking engagement entitled Global Perspectives. I would like to thank the World Trade Center of Greater Philadelphia for joining us as host, and I would like to thank Cyber, our Center for International Business Education and Research, for sponsoring today's event. I would like to thank everyone for joining us as well. As Dean of the Fox School, I think that today's event sits at the core of what we like to do bring together practitioners and researchers and thought leaders with the goal of growing trade, growing commerce, and building our community further. The World Trade Center of Greater Philadelphia, the cyber program at Fox, and our curriculum go hand in hand. We are looking to better the Philadelphia community and beyond. We envision the Fox School as a place for innovative education and as a change maker for its community, including the international business community. Through cyber and our international business programs, we provide learning opportunities that empower our students to become problem solvers. We want them to understand the changes taking place in the global markets, but we also want to position them to be active, to make decisions that move industries and communities forward. Every year, new and emerging markets, technologies, and political realities continue to drive global commerce. This year, as we all know, has brought new and unprecedented challenges to the global marketplace, which brings me to today's event. The topic today is global perspectives. In a moment, you're going to hear from Gary Bine, board member from the World Trade Center. Then Jonathan Shalon of Crane Shares is going to tell us about efforts to stay globally active in this market. We have a panel that will be very informative and helpful as we put the challenges of today into context. Once again, thank you all for joining us. Hello, my name is Gary Bean, and I'm a partner in the Philadelphia headquartered law firm of White and Williams, where I chair the International and China Practice Group. I also proudly serve as chairman of the board of the World Trade Center of Greater Philadelphia. And more importantly, I am a lifetime member of the Temple family. My father worked at Temple three decades, starting in the 1960s. My brother and I graduated from Temple in the 1980s, and this spring, my son will graduate from Temple's Klein School. My Fox School education well prepared me for my career and my professional endeavors. Before the pandemic hit, we were scheduled to gather at Temple University for our global business conference in person. We are still hoping that we'll be able to meet next March uh, 2021 uh, for this event. And today, thanks to our valued partnership with Temple University, Fox School of Business, the Innovation and Entrepreneur Institute, and Cyber, together we are presenting the Global Perspective event to ensure that our audience remains engaged in international trade and receives up to the minute information directly from the member companies that we work with every day to export despite the ever-changing global landscape. Thank you to the World Trade Center member companies, Annie International, ASTM, and Custom Chill who comprise today's export panel and have agreed to share information on their company's challenges and successes. I have no doubt that today's panel discussion led by Dr. Kevin Fandel will be quite motivating. For those of you who don't know about the World Trade Center, since 2002, we have been working with international business to grow trade in southeastern Pennsylvania and the South Jersey region. To date, we have helped companies generate more than $2 billion 
that's, that's billion with a B, in increased export sales, creating more than 26,600 jobs. We are also a nonprofit, membership-based organization, and we're part of a network of more than 300 uh, World Trade Centers in 90 countries. Our work in international trade continues even during these challenging times. To stay up to date, please visit our website, www.wtcphila.org, and consider being a member of our international community. Many thanks and uh, enjoy today's event. Thank you. are expertly prepared for the professional arena. Now it is my pleasure. Good morning. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. I am very proud to introduce our keynote speaker, Jonathan Schellen. Jonathan is the Chief Operating Officer at Crane Shares, an asset management firm delivering China-focused investment strategies to global investors. Prior to Crane, he was the Chief Investment Officer of the Specialized Strategies Team at J.P. Morgan, and before that, he was a Portfolio Manager at Fidelity Investments. Jonathan is a Fox School graduate and is a Fellow of the Society of Actuaries. Though I know Jonathan best as a member of the Fox School's Board of Visitors, where he connects with us on a regular basis to ensure our students are expertly prepared for the professional arena. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Schellen. Good morning. My name is Jonathan Schellen, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Crane Funds Advisors, an asset management firm that specializes in China. We manage 24 exchange traded funds or ETFs globally under the Crane Shares brand. Our ETFs are listed on the New York, London, and Hong Kong stock exchanges. I'm absolutely delighted to be speaking with you today. And my only regret is that I cannot greet you in person. I'd like to send a very special thank you to the World Trade Center of Greater Philadelphia and all my friends at Temple University. I started as a student at Temple University 30 years ago and have seen it transform into the formidable institution and educational powerhouse that it is today. Despite all that, Temple continues to get me involved in prestigious events like this one, which leaves me absolutely baffled. All kidding aside though, I'm honored by this opportunity and I'm excited to share my thoughts on China. Before I get into today's topic, China's next chapter, a look at China today and opportunities for the future, I thought I'd give you a bit more background about myself and Crane Shares. I spent the bulk of my career as an investor. My first jobs out of college were in actuarial and investment consulting, but I soon pivoted to my passion, managing money for others. This journey began at Fidelity Investments, where I started on the team that pioneered target date investing. Target date investing was just getting going in 2001 when I joined, but now there's over a trillion dollars invested in target date funds across 401ks, IRAs, and other retirement plan types. Just before I left Fidelity in 2011, I had the privilege of managing about $150 billion in assets for about 5 million shareholders. After Fidelity, I became the Chief Investment Officer for Specialized Strategies in JP Morgan's private bank. And while I was no longer managing much money directly, I was overseeing a phenomenal team of portfolio managers that specialized in equity fixed income and multi-asset thematic investing. Now, everything was going great, but there was something in the back of my mind telling me that building businesses within large organizations was rewarding, but that building a business from scratch would be even more so. I knew that when the timing was right, I'd be ready to make a change. And so a funny thing happened in late 2014. I attended a meeting at JP Morgan to review a strategy being presented by John Crane, the CEO of Crane Shares. A year earlier, he had just launched an asset management company and his very first China-focused ETF called KWeb focusing on China's internet and e-commerce segment. And while I was familiar with Alibaba's IPO because of JP Morgan's role as book runner, I was surprised to learn that KWeb was the first ETF to actually own Alibaba. I kept in touch with John after our first meeting and six months later, I signed up as Crane Share's fifth 
employee. It was a risky decision. The firm had less than 200 million in assets under management and was just two years old. I was leaving the security and prestige of a leading organization for the uncertainty of a startup. What could possibly go wrong? Well, my first six months on the job were greeted by a couple of interesting events. The first was the bursting of the China A share bubble. And the second was the largest one day depreciation of the RMB, which is China's currency in over 20 years. Ouch. But things did eventually smooth out. We sold a 50.1% stake of our company to China International Capital Corporation in 2017. And today we manage over $5 billion in client assets. Now, China is a unique country and will experience several enduring megatrends that will fuel the economy and capital markets for the next 10 to 20 years by my assessment. For simplicity, it's easiest to think of the drivers for these trends as the three Ps. Each of these drivers impacts the next, so I'll go through them in order. The first P is population. China's the most populous country in the world with about 1.4 billion people. In the early 80s, only 20% of China's population lived in cities, but the number now is closer to 60%. This massive population combined with an enormous urbanization trend has produced six cities with populations greater than 10 million people. To put that in perspective, New York City, where I am right now, would rank as the ninth largest city in China and is only one third the size of the largest Chinese city, Shanghai. How much further will urbanization go in China? Well, if we use developed countries as a guide, it's not uncommon to see 80% and greater urbanization rates. That means that over the next decade or so, roughly 300 million Chinese people, almost the same size as the entire population of the United States will be moving into cities. Urbanization provided China's population with access to proper housing and education as the labor force evolved towards a white collar workforce and a growing urban middle class. This has played a tremendous role in China's economic evolution as the service sector accounts for more than 50% of China's GDP. China is now a service economy and no longer a manufacturing economy principally. This brings us to the second P, penetration. Much like the 60% urbanization rate, China now boasts a 60% internet penetration rate with about a billion users online. And since China has as many millennials as the US has people, these are really tech savvy consumers, many of whom have moved to cities and have become accustomed to doing everything online. The sheer size of China's population has driven a massive domestic consumption economy as China's retail sales are about the same size now as those of the US. Our third P is platform. The most successful companies uh, in China are building out a suite of services in one place, under one umbrella or platform. For example, a user of Tencent's WeChat app can book a hotel, reserve a DD car, which is China's version of Uber, buy a rail ticket or even movie tickets. They can also use WePay to digitally pay for just about everything in the real world. In fact, a physical wallet or purse isn't even necessary in China because cash, credit cards, and ATM cards have largely been supplanted by digital wallets or smartphones. I saw this firsthand on a trip to Shanghai last year when I was turned away from a burrito shop. Yes, you can buy burritos in China uh, because I only had cash RMB and they only accepted digital payments. You see, Tencent's WeChat Pay and Alibaba's Alipay have a payment duopoly within the country. Each have about a billion users on their payment systems, and according to Brookings, over $40 trillion of transaction volume is processed each year. Compare that to the US, where our top digital payment method is Apple Pay, with 30 million users, followed by Starbucks, with 25 million users. Overall digital payment volume in the US is still under a trillion dollars. So China's rapid adoption of e-commerce and digital payments via mobile phones has led to this leapfrogging effect, bypassing big box retailers. This has generated incredible growth in areas like online commerce, transportation, and even healthcare. For example, e-commerce accounts for more than 25% of retail sales in China, compared to 10% in the US and 12% in Europe. 
The same can be seen in the incredible adoption rates for ride hailing and even online healthcare where a large segment of China's population is using connected care technology to share health information, to, uh, to track, um, uh, you know, help to track their health effectively. Uh, for an emerging economy, if you think about it, China is far more developed when it comes to e-commerce and digital payments than a lot of developed countries. The global pandemic though has spared no one, but China appears to be first in first out. The spread of COVID-19 has largely been contained through a disciplined countrywide approach. Life there has returned to normal or at a minimum, a new normal and business prospects are more stable again. And this shift from offline to online has become a long-term structural story in China with COVID acting as the accelerant. For Q2 2020, online retail sales growth has recovered to 21% in China, almost the same growth rate that we observed in the year prior in Q2 of 2019. And in a recent survey, about 80% of consumers confirmed that they had increased online shopping activities, food delivery, watched more online videos, and played mobile games. Also, 58% of consumers verified that they would continue to use online grocery shopping over the long term, probably not distinct from what we're seeing here in the US. These consumer behavior changes send a clear message that the pandemic has shifted people's lifestyles in the direction of technology and there's no going back. What's perhaps most surprising about the global pandemic is how it impacted the stock market. Here in the US, uh, where hotspots, work from home, virtual learning and social distancing are the norm, the U.S. stock market's up by about 9% this year, or at least it was through September. Uh, October's been a little bit of a choppy month. Uh, but yes, the stock market is still up, and there are many reasons. Uh, interest rates are all-time low, stimulus is at all-time highs, and there's an insatiable risk appetite from everyone under the age of 30, seemingly. So now this 9% return number really belies the fact that there are very clear winners and losers in today's US stock market. Growth stocks, for example, are up about 24% this year. And US growth stocks come predominantly for sec from sectors like information technology, consumer discretionary, and healthcare. On the other hand, US value stocks are down about 11% this year. Uh, and those emphasize financials, industrial, staples, and utilities. Before I turn to China, it's important to provide some background. First, China has the world's second largest stock market with a market capitalization of around $10 trillion. Chinese companies are mainly listed on the US, Hong Kong, and mainland China exchanges. For most individuals, it's not easy to buy outside of US exchanges. And even if they were able to purchase Chinese equities from say Hong Kong or the mainland, they would not know how to turn a series of investment holdings into a well-designed portfolio. Uh, so this is precisely what we do at Crane Shares with our ETFs. We package baskets of stocks into an exchange traded fund that can be easily purchased throughout uh, the US in a regular brokerage account while gaining a uh, much wider universe of companies. So just to put uh, China's performance into perspective, our flagship strategy, KWeb, the one that was launched in 2013 and that focuses on mega trends we discussed earlier, um, KWeb buys those very companies that are participating in China's growth in internet and e-commerce segments. And much like the growth segment of the US stock market, KWeb also emphasizes the consumer technology and healthcare sectors. Now, this year alone, KWeb is up almost 40% through September, bringing cumulative returns from 2013 to about 189%. And our China healthcare strategy called Cure, K-U-R-E, has performed even better up about 44% through September. So even when we move beyond thematic investing and look at our broader strategies, um, like KBA, which is a bit like China's version of the S&P and represents 475 listed stocks on the mainland, we see a 21% return. So in a nutshell, we're experiencing performance in China's equity market that is about twice that of the US this year. Part of this outperformance can be attributed to China's leadership in stopping the virus spread and the catalyzing impact 
it has had on pushing more Chinese consumers online, even for non-traditional online services like durable goods and healthcare. It's also fair to say that the political rhetoric coming out of Washington has kept China's markets more muted over the years than they would have been otherwise. So some of this is catch up performance and brings valuations like price to earnings closer to those of other regions. While the past nine months of performance is encouraging, especially during a pandemic, it does not tell us much about the future. So now I'm going to attempt to peer into my crystal ball and address a range of important topics that will shape China's growth in the years to come. There are three areas that are, I remain really excited about when thinking about China's future the stock market, the bond market, and China's evolving role in the world. Despite the pandemic, many new companies have come to market this year. In the first six months of 2020, there were nearly 30% more new equity listings in the greater China market than there were in 2019, which means that companies have raised about 72% uh, more capital than they did in the prior year. The upcoming Ant Group IPO, which is actually happening one week from today, will be the largest IPO in history anywhere. Ant Group is the digital payments and financial services arm of Alibaba and will list on both the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and the Shanghai Stock Exchange at Starboard, which is China's new tech focused exchange. Ant Group is well known for its pioneering of the Alipay mobile payment platform, which was launched as part of Alibaba in 2004. Ant Group's IPO should benefit Alibaba as a one third owner of the company. As investors in China's internet and e-commerce space, we believe that the entire China internet and e-commerce sector could be re-rated due to Ant Group's valuation post IPO. It's estimated right now that Ant Group will raise about $34 billion, which would value the company at $310 billion. Ant Group is the largest digital payment company globally via Alipay. Ant Group's credit tech, invest tech, and insure tech business units represent China's largest online platforms for consumer credit, investment, and insurance. Effectively, it's like four companies in one, which is why it's valuable. Needless to say, many of our strategies will be early buyers of Ant. And if we compare Ant to the S&P 500 at its estimated IPO value, it'd be ranked number 16, just above JP Morgan. The Ant story alone is enough to get me excited about the future prospects of consumer and tech companies in China, but there's also a steady pipeline of private firms that will be future IPOs on a global scale. If we consider the 10 largest private companies in the world, four of them are actually in China. China's become the world's leading unicorn factory overtaking the US last year. Now our firm has long held the view that China is an asset class in its own right, and we're encouraged by these developments. Equity markets in China continue to benefit not only from increased foreign investment and restrict, as restrictions are eased, but also from increased domestic investment as Chinese households begin to hold more stocks as they grow wealth. China's equity market, the second largest in the world, represents over 40% of the investment opportunity within all of emerging markets. And we're seeing a steady shift in thinking as China is being separated from emerging markets by institutional investors. These sophisticated managers of pension plans, endowments, and large wealth funds are treating China like a distinct category, just as they've done with other prominent categories like Japan in the 90s and emerging markets in the 2000s. Needless to say, I'm quite optimistic about flows into China's economy, which will continue to fuel the opening up of China's capital markets and investment opportunities. What I'm less enthusiastic about, although optimistic, is the elephant in the room the US-China relationship. We all know the saying, everything in moderation. And while it's hard to pinpoint, it's clear that the US definition of what is or isn't moderate has changed rapidly in the last few years. For example, there was a time when we were happy to buy inexpensive machinery, furniture, bedding, and toys from China. There was a time when we were happy to borrow money from China by selling low-yielding US Treasury bonds. But at some point in the last decade, we reached the too much of a good thing milestone. Maybe it's because in 2015, China's service sector became the largest contributor to its economy. Following in the United States footsteps, China's transformed into a service sector and consumer-driven economy 
away from manufacturing and exports. This was a slow process, but the tipping point was reached years ago. So sadly for US-China relations, what was good is now bad, what was encouraged is now shunned, and the only thing that Democrats and Republicans can seemingly agree on is that something must be done about China. Yet no one has demonstrated how hurting China helps the US. On the contrary, China is now our number one trade partner, surpassing Canada and Mexico. And we're the number one trade partner for China. Our trade with China actually supports over a million US jobs. Additionally, US companies derive nearly $400 billion in revenue each year from China, which is about the same as our trade deficit. So we're on a slippery slope to lose-lose if we ignore the significance of how each country benefits from a positive trade relationship. But here's where my optimism comes in. This is an election year, so of course political rhetoric is at an all-time high. While I don't hold any illusions that either a Trump or Biden administration is going to pivot 180 degrees on China, I do believe that today's boiling over will be brought down to a slower simmer once the election is concluded. A drop in temperature will allow cooler heads to prevail and shift us from impolite and irrational discourse into something that results in mutually beneficial outcomes. Whether it's art of the deal or Mr. Rogers diplomacy, it can happen and it should. Like it or not, the US and China are inextricably linked. Our economies are connected through trade and the people of both countries have a lot in common. Chinese people admire Americans in our education system, family focus, ingenuity, entrepreneurship, resourcefulness, and work ethic. These are the very same qualities that have allowed China to transform its economy and build phenomenal businesses of their own. We now have an opportunity to promote economic prosperity for both countries, but it will take a different approach. The rules of the road must change, and this applies to how we engage with one another, and also how we govern trade, cross-border business opportunities, and even IP. I believe that there is a genuine willingness on both sides to establish this new framework, but prior efforts were hampered by too much politicization of the process. I'm a huge fan of transparency, but this is one of those times where having a six month quiet period to hash out the details could be the best path forward. 2020 has been a banner year for China, a country that's emerged as a source of hope and stability during the pandemic and as a contributor of superior returns for the fortunate few that held enough of an allocation to China's capital markets. Recent events have highlighted not only China's importance in global financial markets, but also its ability to produce differentiated results when compared to other emerging market countries and even developed market countries. Thank you for your time and attention this morning. It's been a true privilege to be with you today and I look forward to engaging with you during our Q&A session. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ron Drews, and I'm an assistant professor here in the Fox School of Business in the Strategic Management Department and the International Business Programs. So we are glad to have Jonathan here. Um, my role is to be a moderator for the questions. And as I had uh, previously worked with the World Trade Center and here at now at Temple, I want to bridge the two and be able to bring these good programs to you. So Jonathan, that was a very uh, intriguing presentation you had. And there's a lot of activity that's happening now because China is having their fifth plenum. And that's actually happening this week. And it's really setting the stage for policy going forward in their 14th five-year plan, which will be from 2021 to 2025. Um, what do you think the focus of that will be? And what can we expect to hear from China's strategic direction in the next coming years? Great, thanks, Ron. Yeah, that's that's really interesting and timely, right? Um, China has a very um, kind of intriguing approach where they set out to create these five-year plans, and it, this isn't just kind of um, kind of a political guideline. This really impacts sectors inside the country. And you know, in speaking to our CEO, he said that in prior five-year plans, he's seen people actually switch careers, change their careers to try to be more in line 
with the direction of where things are going. So, so this isn't just some you know, kind of document that says, here's what we're thinking. Um, there's a lot of impact that these five-year plans have. The thing that's gonna come out of this one is gonna be, there's gonna be some things that are quite similar, um, namely this focus on technology and really being self-sufficient. Um, and that's gonna be referred to in, in China a lot as internal circulation. This notion that we have to, you know, within China, increase our own demand um, and continue on this path to being more of a service economy and less export driven, less dependent on other countries, um, you know, to, to purchase things from China. Um, but then there's also going to be this concept called dual circulation. And this is one that we're starting to hear more, more and more about as, as news gets out. And that's going to also recognize that, you know, China can't just completely shut off the rest of the world via exports. They have to bring the the rest of the world in kind of enhance the internationalization of the country uh, through an opening up. So there's also going to be a focus on opening up even further strategically important industries and sectors, um, including the capital markets, so the stock market, the bond market, and even private investing. So I, I think that what you're going to see is, on one hand, an emphasis on greater self-sufficiency, um, which is important kind of in, this, in these polarizing times but also a recognition that to be successful, China also needs to attract foreign capital and open up its country to foreign flows. Okay, very good. Yes, they, it's well known that they will likely need to open up um, their, their capital and bring more in. And that kind of brings us to an, another topic that China has been worked on in the last number of years, and that's the One Belt, One Road or the Belt and Road Initiative. And that's you know, the major infrastructure undertaking to connect China to the rest of the world, um, both by um, land and sea. And it was, it was uh, opened by President uh, Xi Jinping in 2013. What's the progress on it that you see? Um, and what might be the opportunities for companies and investors in that regard? Yeah, we've been watching this closely because one of the things we assumed, just, just for context, so, so the, there used to be something called the Old Silk Road, right, which was kind of a land route that traveled from China westerly and, and it was, was very popular and it helped really create development in a lot of uh, emerging countries. And so when President Xi announced this initiative, his goal was to kind of rebuild the Old Silk Road, but do it by land as well as by sea and obviously do it in a manner that supported a lot of emerging countries, countries that are in that region that could use infrastructure support. So it was viewed much more as kind of an infrastructure project, helping build, you know, railways and highways and other things. But increasingly, it has turned also into a technology project where, you know, China laid a lot of uh, fiber optic cables throughout South Africa and so on. So we've been watching this closely because one would think that during the pandemic, things would shut down. But it turns out that just in the first seven months of this year, um, foreign direct investment by Chinese firms in these regions has been about $10 billion, so about 30% higher uh, year on year. Um, and there's been about $30 billion worth of new contracts signed. So um, the path continues on, but I think the slight modification is that it's expanded to also include what's being called a health healthcare Silk Road, namely China supplying medical supplies um, and other medicines across these paths, as well as a digital Silk Road where there's even a greater focus on having China help build out technological infrastructure as well as kind of traditional brick and mortar infrastructure. So from an opportunity standpoint, you know, if I was an investor, um, the opportunity isn't necessarily to partner with China here, but to identify where they're doing these things and invest in those regions. So, um, and, and what's interesting is more countries are getting involved. Um, just last year, Italy was the first G7 country to sign up to be part of the Belt and Road Initiative. So if I was an investor deploying personal capital, I'd be looking at you know, areas where new ports are going up, new highways are going up, new, new highways are, are taking place and investing in those areas, recognizing they're gonna benefit from these initiatives. It, it's, it's a little bit akin to having bought up a lot of real estate around Temple University 20 years ago. Um, that would have been a good decision. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily partnering with Temple University. 
It just means that you see the opportunity around it. Okay, very good. Yeah, so there is a lot of opportunity, just a matter of how, how to address it and how, how to actually tap into it. Right. All right, great. So thank you very much. Um, we'll see if there are other questions and we'll have to watch the time here just to make sure that we're staying on. Um, so I think we'll probably need to move to the next panel in order to stay on time. So Jonathan, thank you so much for your insights. They were very informative and gives us a lot of perspective here. Um, so what I'll do now is lead on into the next panel. So we have the exporters panel, and this is going to be moderated by Dr. Kevin Fandel. Um, Dr. Fandel is an associate professor of business law and serves as the executive director of Temple's Cyber or the Center for International Business Education and Research. And he's also the academic director of the Global Immersion Program. Uh, prior to joining Temple, Kevin worked for the U.S. attorney or, or as a U.S. attorney for the U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency. And in 10 years serving the federal service, he ultimately served as chief of staff for international trade and intellectual property for the US Department of Homeland Security. His areas of focus are in international trade law and public policy and in China as well. So he teaches um, here at Temple and many places around the world. And he's also published over 50 journals and five books. So I'll turn it over to Kevin now and he'll be able to lead the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ron. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today as well on this international business panel as part of the Global Perspectives um, Conference. Special thanks to the World Trade Center of Philadelphia as well as the Fox School of Business for hosting this event. And of course, to Temple Cyber, uh, which has been sponsoring this important discussion. Again, my name is Kevin Fandel, and I am pleased to be the moderator of this important panel on international business. As our panelists and participants no doubt know, this presentation would normally have been given in person with everyone together in the same room but the pandemic has made that simply impossible this year. However, it has allowed us to engage with a much wider audience through Zoom and YouTube, expanding the reach and the impact of the comments that you are hearing today. We are facing unprecedented times in global business, and we have brought together this amazing group of experts to highlight how this state of affairs has affected their operations, and what they're doing to face the uncertainties of the future. So without further ado, let me begin our discussion by introducing our panelists. Uh, today we have with us Teresa Sandrowska, and she is the Vice President for Global Cooperation at ASTM International, which is a leading global standards development organization. Uh, she's now focused on transitioning economies and encouraging their use of ASTM standards to support regulatory and market needs. Teresa began her work at ASTM as a technical committee manager. And in that role, she supported volunteer experts from the public and private sectors in formulating the consensus standards used worldwide to support health, safety, quality, market access, innovation, regulation, and trade. Ms. Sandrowska holds a Bachelor of Science in Industrial Engineering from the University of Pittsburgh, and she earned her MBA from right here at the Fox School of Business. She's uh, happy to join the session to share with us how ASTM is responding to the challenges of the pandemic and supporting its stakeholders to do the same. Our second panelist, Natu Dandor, is the President and CEO of Custom Chill, and in addition to running two additional manufacturing companies of engineered products, which include medical devices and thermoelectric based cooling devices. Natu is experienced in building and growing strong and profitable companies with a focus on strong customer relations and creating unique incentive plans for all employees. Natu is also a member of Vistage, the world's largest executive coaching organization 
and Robinhood Ventures, a Philadelphia-based venture capital firm that invests in early stage, high growth startup companies. Natu has his undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering and likewise, he has his MBA from right here at the Fox School. Uh, and lastly, but surely not least, is Stephen Miller, the Executive Director for Annie International Incorporated. Uh, he leads the company's global business development in sales, marketing, and operations across six continents. Stephen has partnered in new business development with sales and most national retailers, domestic and international governments, Fortune 500 companies and A-list celebrities with vast experience in numerous markets, including sporting goods, aerospace and defense, fashion, cosmetics, and transportation industries for products ranging from consumer goods to manufactured OEM items. So we have an amazing panel of experts and they have a lot of great insights to share with us in a very short amount of time. So, there has been much said about uh, the, there couldn't be much said about these businesses and the leaders representing them on any given day. But our goal today is to better understand how these businesses are adapting in the face of unique circumstances, adjusting to the changes in consumer demand, challenges in supply chains, the global economic slowdown. So let me begin with Teresa and ask her to speak a little bit about her standards organization and how they are adapting to the current business environment. Teresa. Thank you, Kevin. And I wanna add my thanks as well to the World Trade Center of Greater Philadelphia and to the Temple's Fox School for this opportunity to share information and participate in the panel. So I'll start with a general description of, of the work we do in ASTM and then give some more specifics about how we're pivoting. Um, first of all, ASTM is a not-for-profit that's committed to supporting global societal needs. And we do that by improving public health and safety, consumer confidence, and the overall quality of life. Our work relies on the expertise of 30,000 business and science experts who come from more than 150 countries. Uh, they are the individuals who determine what standards are needed to address the challenges they have and what the content of those documents will be. So the result is nearly 13,000 technical standards that address the needs of more than 90 industry sectors, including personal protective equipment and medical and surgical materials and devices. And finally, in response to our stakeholders who want a transparent, forum that supports science-based consensus documents that minimize barriers to trade, support convergence and consistency, and open market access, we embrace the World Trade Center, I'm sorry, the World Trade Organization technical barriers to trade principles for developing international standards. Now specifically, in terms of examples of how our members in ASTM are pivoting to address uh, the supply, the shortage in the supply of of um, personal protective equipment. Um, I'll point to the work of two of our 146 technical committees. There's a committee on personal protective clothing and equipment and a committee on medical and surgical materials and devices. And together they've formed a collaborative group to fast track the development of standards to help meet the PPE shortage. That group has um, basically worked together to identify gaps for what new standards are needed or where revisions would support um, quality, manufacturing, and evaluation of PPE. Last month, they joined together uh, in an online two-day workshop uh, attended by about 400 individuals from 35 countries to look at specific topics like reprocessing of single-use PPE, reusable PPE, and even details for a common general-use mask. The result is that they've identified, they've created a roadmap and they're working now uh, to quickly create the standards that expedite the design evaluation and um, materials used for the manufacture of PPE materials and devices. Apart from that, ASTM has taken action to support production and advanced quality and safety in the global supply chain. So ASTM has made available at no cost in their reading room on a public site 28 standards that address medical masks, gloves, um, 
gowns, hand sanitizer, thermometers, and ventilators. And what we found is that there have been over 148,000 page views of this COVID-19 landing page. And that individuals viewing that page are coming from more than 115 countries. We've made a concerted effort to inform manufacturing associations, manufacturers, government regulators, and health and safety professionals that this resource is available. And as a result, ASTM standards have been recommended by the World Health Organization and are being cited by governments from Costa Rica to Chinese Taipei to South Africa. In addition, our Additive Manufacturing Center of Excellence has posted a COVID-19 response guide that's also available online at no cost and is being used to provide guidance on additively manufactured parts and materials for PPE. So we're pleased to support our technical committees and we're really um, fortunate to be able to support the development um, of this critical bent content and to share our commitment to the overall quality of life and health and safety. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much, Teresa. Natu, your newest business, Custom Chill, provides essential technology for industries like laser manufacturers. Tell us a little bit about how it works and how your operations may have been affected in recent months. I'd like my convey my thanks to World Trade Center for organizing this event and to my favorite and the most important thing in my life, the Temple Fox School. That was a school back in 1982 when I did my MBA, put me on the path and create uh, capabilities to be an entrepreneur. A custom chill uh, provides uh, cooling devices, which are for very precision cooling using thermoelectric chips, which is different than refrigeration or using uh, uh, that kind of heavy equipment. And it's used by manufacturers of uh, precise precision lasers, which are used in the uh, microsurgery. And most of our customers are in Western Europe, uh, in the foreign customers, but they also have customers in USA and in North, North America. Uh, when this pandemic hit, the biggest concern our customers had was number one, that will we be staying open and the supplies line will be safe. Uh, in addition to Custom Chill, I also own two other manufacturing companies, which also make medical equipment and provide uh, equipment for defense. So we, throughout this period, we have stayed open and we assured our customers that your supply will not be uh, interrupted. And we took precautions to make sure the safety of our employees all together in our companies, we have about 170 employees and Thank God we only had one case of, of COVID, minor case, uh, but no uh, hospitalization. The sales were affected definitely. Our customers have slowed down. But what we have done is that we have maintained uh, our employee base and also maintained our uh, working with the customers for the future future products for, for them. Uh, these, you know, one of our customers is in, uh, is in Western Europe, is in Austria. And they are the leading uh, uh, suppliers of uh, precision lasers for the uh, for microsurgery, mostly for eye surgeries. And so they were very much concerned because it takes a long time for the device which they manufacture to approve a chiller like what we manufacture. So it was not something they can go and switch and buy for somebody else. So we have assured them and by maintaining our supply to them, even at the slower rate of production, we have actually given them concessions and we are working with them on new products for the next generation of, uh, of lasers. So the biggest challenge we faced was number one, to stay open, stay healthy, and also to continue investing in uh, our people. We have no layoffs, we have no cutbacks, and assuring our customers that the supply line to them will be open and uh, uh, we, are, we are maintaining that. Great, Natu, thank you so much for that overview of Custom Chill and, and how you're addressing the current situation. Now, over to you, Stephen. Your beauty supply products are sold in 49 countries, I believe, but I imagine you've been seeing some declining demand worldwide. 
So what is Annie International doing to adapt to these changed circumstances? Yes, good morning, Kevin. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, World Trade Center and Fox School of Business for uh, having us on and uh, a member of the panel. Um, we, at our core, uh, are a beauty supply manufacturer. Um, as you mentioned, we are in 49 countries operating on six continents. We have distribution centers throughout uh, much of that region that we own independently. Um, at our core, we are a beauty supply manufacturer. Uh, we're also manufacturing cosmetics as well as medical PPE. Um, for us, at the beginning of COVID, it literally stopped us within 24 hours. 95% of our business globally stopped immediately. So we had to, like everybody else, pivot, um, come up with a business plan on how are we going to maneuver this? How are we going to handle this? Fortunately for us, uh, for the past 15 to 20 years, we've had relationships with our factories globally uh, for medical PPE. And those are items that not just our country and our customers needed, but other customers throughout the world needed, other governments, military, healthcare systems globally. We quickly pivoted. We immediately spoke with those factories. We paused a lot of our inbound shipments, which we're bringing in between 350 and 400 full-size containers annually uh, just to the United States alone. So we pivoted, worked with our factories, and we started bringing in medical, uh, medical supplies, medical PPE to be exact. Um, we created our full-blown medical PPE division. Uh, we were able to increase our manufacturing to 4.5 million masks alone per week. And we immediately just started contacting our distribution channels, whether it was B2C, uh, to be able to supply consumers um, with their health and safety needs. We worked with our distributors for healthcare systems. We immediately contacted a lot of the state governments, Washington, D.C., and a lot of the governments that we deal with globally to supply them directly from our manufacturing facilities with millions of masks on every shipment. So we are dealing with the Department of Defense, the healthcare system, Social Security Administration, uh, supplying a ton to Mexico. Um, but for us, it, it's been very challenging with the ever-changing laws, the packaging changes, all the requirements throughout COVID. Uh, but we've found great success in it. Um, we've been supplying, we actually added to our medical PPE line. We have anything from masks to gowns, to goggles, to face shields, thermometers, you name it. And now through our partnerships with the World Trade Center, with a lot of the Chamber of Commerce and the governments, as well as national retail chains in the United States and internationally, we've been able to keep that supply going continually every week, every month to basically help people be safer around the world. Great, Stephen, thank you. Thank you very much. We're, all of you just introduced your businesses and talked a little bit about how the current pandemic is affecting you. But as we know, even prior to the, the pandemic, we were in the midst of a global trade war. We uh, saw a lot of decline in demand for products. We saw a lot of countries moving toward protectionism, increases in tariffs, much more difficulty in acquiring some of the things that we need. So I'm wondering if you could <clears throat> tie that in any way into your current operation. Did what was happening prior to the pandemic with these, this increasing protectionism have an impact on your ability to, for example, get your supplies as Natu was talking about, or in the, in the case of Teresa, to, to work with other countries on establishing standards. Um, let's, let's actually start with Teresa on this one. Well, thanks, Kevin. I, I would say that um, actually, the current situation, if nothing else, has created opportunities for us to have more conversations. Um, 
you're right that you know working globally, particularly with developing countries, has its challenges. Um, but what we've seen is that there's a greater uh, embrace of technology. Countries in transition that would normally not have the ability to participate have uh, really gotten on board with some of the tools. And what we've also seen is that um, where protocol would have probably indicated it wasn't appropriate to have high level meetings virtually, more of that's possible. So we've really been able to engage in more uh, meaningful conversation. And in fact, have seen uh, that our typical metrics for developing standards are right on target. So there's a silver lining to, to what we've encountered. That's good to hear, Teresa, that there is some, something positive we can take away from the situation. Just as we're able to meet over the Zoom and share with so many of our viewers all of your insights, this would have been quite more limited and restricted if we were in person. So that's, that's a, a big plus. Natu, you were talking a little bit uh, before about getting some of the licensing approvals and, and the, the ability to get the certifications that you need for your products. Has, uh, has this move towards more protectionism in the world had any impact on your ability to source your supplies? Uh, not really, Kevin. We did not see that uh, because uh, it is a long process for the approval of a, a product we, like we make. For that we integrate into the customer's product which they supply to the hospitals and to the doctors. So it, it's not an easy switch and we did not feel that before that there was protectionism and in terms of trying to hold, uh, uh, hold uh, cut back on, on, on foreign, foreign critical supplies. Most of the things we provide uh, in my other company also, we make equipment for a large company, but it's, it's a CAT scan machines for the dental industry. And uh, so those sales were not affected before actually. We did not notice that, which was very fortunate. Uh, and and the, I, the, in my opinion, the main thing is that even though there is a competition and their protectionism, but they also want to protect their own industry, want to help them too. They, could, they do not want to deprive them of uh, technology or equipment which has been tested and approved by, the, uh, by their local agencies over a long period of time. So I was very, very fortunate. We did not feel that before. Very happy to hear that, not to. Yeah. Stephen, over to you, and perhaps you can reference us in respect to your previous products before you switched over to a lot of the PPE gear. But did you feel any effects, any slowdowns, or were you able to, to overcome that because of your strong relationships across six continents and 49 countries? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, for us, we, as I mentioned, we paused on importing many of the beauty supply products, but having suppliers in many countries, we immediately started bringing in the PPEs from those other countries. Um, however, many countries such as South Korea, Vietnam, they closed their borders. They wanted to keep their supplies in the country because they saw the pandemic as hey, this is a crisis that we need these PPEs in-house. We need them in our country. So therefore, it left the United States, which we could not source PPE from. Many of those PPEs were going straight to healthcare systems uh, that the government was distributing. Um, then that left just China. So we had to bring everything in from China. China's laws and requirements for packaging, reporting on factories, as well as the United States laws to make sure that reputable, true quality products were coming in, they were literally changing every single week. So it was becoming extremely difficult. We would manufacture, we would get product to the port ready to, ready to go through customs to board a plane or a ship to come over, and it would immediately be stopped because a law would change. So we had to constantly pivot for three to four months straight, and it would literally change within six hours time. The other thing is, is the whole country, the world, everybody needed PPEs immediately. So with that being said, ocean freaked out. Now it's air freight. Typically the world is used to, let's say for us, a $2 per kilogram and $6 per kilogram cost to air in shipments, okay? So now all of a sudden with the lack of planes that were coming in, going into China, coming to the US because airlines weren't wanting to fly into China. Nobody was wanting to go into China. 
those air freight costs went up to 20, 25, 30 dollars per kilogram. I mean, it was it was crazy. So therefore, your cost of goods was the smaller amount, and your air freight cost was two to three times more. So we were also dealing with that, which literally PPE cost times by 10, air freight costs times by 20. So the global demand increased by a hundredfold. So the cost went through the roof. So as quickly as it went up, it then quickly dropped within three to four months. Now air freight's hovering around eight to $10 per kilogram. Uh, PPE costs are still about five times the norm post COVID or pre COVID, if you will. If you don't mind, Stephen, let me follow up on something that you said. Since your, your company really did basically stop producing, I understand, these beauty products and switch over to PPE, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how Annie International made that initial decision. I recall at the beginning of the pandemic that most of the PPE, as you said, was coming in from China. There were a lot of concerns about supply chains, about the costs of getting the goods here. Would there be a consistent supply? What is it that, that drove your organization to make that, that strategic decision to start uh, acquiring PPE on your own? Yeah, I mean, for one, um, we were always in the PPE business for 15 to 20 years. Um, we just needed to ramp up production. Within 24 to 48 hours, uh, we're in close contact with our customers we were getting notified, phone ringing off the book, emails, our reps in the field being told, hey, we're no longer a central business, so our stores are shutting down. Um, like any business, we try to manage our inventory levels. So we have, you know, six months, seven months, eight months, nine months of the year supply and stock. So we knew that if the demand came back quickly, we had that inventory in-house to supply it. But when orders stop overnight, um, you got to figure out a way to keep your business open. So that is when we immediately started putting in purchase orders to ramp up that production and to start bringing over the PPEs. Um, obviously, anything manufactured, you know, we kept coming on the water, but we just slowed down on our, our purchase orders for the beauty supply products until businesses would reopen. Um, fortunately, there were some national chains, U.S. and, and international that were allowed to stay open for a central business, such as a Walmart, Target, you know, in the United States. So there were still some beauty supply products. Um, and when I say beauty supply, I mean uh, personal care for hair, um, manicure, pedicure, stuff like that. Um, but that's the decision we had to make very quickly, within literally within days time. Actually, within 24 hours time, we had to come up with a plan like that. Very responsive business model. Very, very good, Stephen. Thank you. Um, Teresa, we're talking here with, or I'm talking here with Stephen about his uh, PPE or his beauty products, not to talking a little bit about lasers and, and, and more tangible things. What you're working with is less tangible. You're dealing with standards. So I, I wonder how do you how do you look at establishing standards in this time of COVID and, and still responding to a lot of the changes that are happening out there? How has your work changed in a sense? Uh, well, thanks. You know, the process for ASTM is that our demand for standards is really very much driven by our stakeholders. So those are the companies, the suppliers, uh, government representatives, consumers. Um, they're the ones coming forward to utilize our tools and our process to create the documents that they need to address their challenges. Um, increasingly, I'd have to say that we're, uh, because we're a consensus organization and that requires a great deal of um, debate and discussion, just like all of us are on a uh, virtual session that's happening with um, ASTM meetings as well. Uh, so it's important to remember that um, to identify those needs. And we can, our, our experts are very responsive. Our pro process is very flexible. So as you identify needs, um, we invite you to bring those forward uh, to allow the technical experts to have that debate and discussion. Um, it's important that anyone who's interested participate because it is an open process. And um, if 
you're not there, your competitors, your customers, your regulators are there and they're creating the documents that you're gonna be obligated to meet in terms of quality or um, regulatory compliance and market access. So um, I would just say that it's really important to participate, to provide the input um, and to use the tools that we offer so that we're able to shorten the supply chain, chain address some of the issues that Stevens mentioned um, utilize those tools called the technical resource called standards to continue to, to uh, enable um, companies to work globally, to minimize the barriers to trade, to support convergence and compliance. Thank you, Teresa. And, and a quick follow-up for you. As you mentioned a little bit earlier, you your organization works closely with the World Trade Organization on the technical barriers to trade agreement, uh, the TPT agreement. What do you see as the, the future of, of that standards agreement? And, and this may be a little bit more of your opinion that more than anything else, but there's a lot of controversy right now about um, obviously selecting a new WTO president, but also about support for the continuation of the rules that the WTO has established. Do you, do you, do you find yourself in more of an advocacy position um, on behalf of international standards? What we find, really the, the focus of our engagement on WTO uh, is, um, a, and a good example of that, for example, would be the, rate, the recent uh, USMCA trade agreement. There's typically in trade agreements a chapter on standards. And in the past, um, some of those chapters in trade agreements have said that they, they, they qualify international standards as standards belonging to one particular collection of uh, international standards developers. Um, chapters on international standards have changed and um, they're more likely applying the definition that the World Trade Organization has defined. Um, they've identified six principles that international standards development organizations follow to create the documents that won't intentionally create barriers to trade. Um, we've really made a concerted effort to educate people about those six principles, things like consensus, openness, transparency, relevance, coherence, and development dimension, um, so that our standards serve the needs of the stakeholders, and they really do um, minimize barriers to trade, support good regulatory practice, and open markets. Excellent. That, that's a great response, Teresa. Thank you so much. In, in the few minutes that we have left, let me pivot for a moment here. Um, not to you, uh, obviously, you're running Custom Chill, a very successful business, but you've run other businesses as well, or, or perhaps you, you still are. Um, and as any good business professional knows, part the heart of doing business is entering successful contracts, uh, supply contracts, licensing contracts, ensuring that, that you are protected. I've been wondering since the beginning of the pandemic about how business executives might be changing the way they think about those contracts to better protect themselves um, with escape clauses, force majeure clauses, in light of, of what's happening right now. Have you seen any changes in the contracting process with your partners, with your suppliers, with your clients uh, in light of, of the current situation? Can, fortunately, no, we have not seen any change in that. And uh, I don't see we are unique. Either most of our other manufacturing businesses I've spoken with, if you're well established, you have a good customer base and we all understand, they understand, our supplier understand, this is a temporary phase, what we are going through. Whatever the temporary means, could be weeks, months, or a year, but it's still a temporary phase. And when we are in business, we are in business to perpetuity. So all good business people, uh, I've seen uh, large companies, we have customers, you know, International Business Machine is my customer for the last 37 years. And uh, they really have acted this same way and other customers too, I can name them uh, uh, many. Uh, in a, in a long-term relationship which we have established with them and with our suppliers. So uh, I've not seen any uh, requirements. The biggest uh, uh, concern both sides had was that, that we can stay operational. And that was the biggest challenge I, we faced was when it started, that how will we maintain the safety of our employees, safety of our supply base? And 
the first questions I received from all of our customers was the very first week, are you open? And will you stay open? Fortunately for us, we do both the medical equipment and defense. So we were in the essential industries, so, so we could stay open. But my management team uh, made sure that we took precautions. We were on to masks way before it became pop popular. Everybody to wear masks in the company. We uh, made sure that there's not uh, visitors were minimized or uh, almost eliminated, and uh, started using Zoom. Uh, for, but you are answering your question. No, we did not see that change. That I, I just a unique fortunate. But I think it is also based on a long-term relationship on both sides. When you, the, when the customer trusts you, and the supplier trusts you, and uh, our focus is to take care of the customer, and also consider suppliers as a key partners in that, uh, then, you, then those changes or uh, requirements will has, has not affected us. Very good, Natsu, thank you. And, and I think you and Stephen probably share in the fact that you've both been working um, with some sort of PPE in a sense. You've been working in the medical industry with masks uh, for some time. So you're a bit more experienced than most business executives out there who I think are struggling to figure out how to adapt. Uh, and that's a great segue into the last question that I'd like to ask all of you. Stephen, I'll start with you. What is the future? for business. Not to mention just a moment ago, they're, they're kind of hoping things are going to go back to, to where things were, contracting, et cetera. But I wonder, these changes that you're making, are these changes permanent? Are these things that are going to drive the future business model? Even if we do get to a point where we have a vaccine or uh, we've, we've come to terms with the situation and adapted properly, What's your business going to do? Will you return to the previous practices or are you going to uh, continue doing what you've begun doing under the circumstances of the pandemic? Stephen. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, for us, uh, real quickly, we were very different from the two. We have ourselves long-term relationships by being in consumer goods, um, contracts, agreements, everything they did not matter. They stayed in place for normal products, but for PPEs, the way the world was working, manufacturers, factories, they immediately needed cash up front. You had to pay cash up front, no question about it, no ifs, ands, or buts. They too were trying their hardest to get textiles, to manufacture masks, manufacture nitrile gloves. Um, so therefore, in turn, any orders that we had to place, we had to pay cash up front. Therefore, our contracts our agreements with large national retail chains, with the governments, they were null and void when it came to PPEs. If they wanted product, there were no terms. You pay cash, you pay cash now. As soon as we get it, we wire that money. We get in PPEs. Um, now that things, that was during the height of COVID for about three to four months. Now that things have slowed down, manufacturing supplies have come up we've been able to now start getting terms back for PPEs. It's always been there for the other products, um, but we're seeing things go back to normal in the way of the agreements, the terms, contracts, and all that. Um, as far as the normal course of doing business, uh, I'm used to personally being on the road two, three times a month, uh, internationally, domestically. Uh, I'm not used to sitting in front of the computers and doing Zoom, but um, that is now my world. Uh, I am on Zoom every day. Um, we are learning how to do that. We're getting pretty good at it. I think that that's gonna be the, the way of the future. Um, I think it's loosened people up to the concept of being online. So in, in my perspective, I think 50-50, I think there's still gonna be a lot of online Zooms, but I think there's nothing like relationship building in person. So I think that that will still go on. I have loosened up and started traveling myself with some of our teams. Um, but to answer your question, I think it has changed the world in the future. I think it's gonna be about a 50-50 blend because we now see how to do things more efficiently. Very good. Uh, Natu, your thoughts? Uh, I, I took a little, bit, uh, a little differently being manufacturing so uh, what has really uh, seen us through this period is the relationship we built with our customers 
by providing them more than just what they asked for. Now, how can we provide more than what they asked for? Well, we provide design services. In way back, the customer used to provide us the drawings and specifications, and they say, okay, manufacture this part for it, or this assembly for us, for them. And now, even for large companies, we offer them design services where we design the product for them, and then also manufacture it for them. So what I have, we have, what our focus is to maintain and enhance those skilled people, training, equipment, whatever technology we need to buy in for the future. Uh, people will still need products. They will need medical equipment. They will need defense equipment. They'll need part for the aeroplanes, even though right now they are slow. So those industries and those businesses are not going to go away. So we have maintained our uh, niche by excelling not only in technical services, but also customers focus. I mean, a lot of people say about that, but I'm very fortunate to really have a team which really believes in that. So my, my uh, I hope I'm proven not wrong, you know, I want to prove right, that we, uh, you know, continue spending same way, investing in people. Uh, that's the biggest asset we have. We have almost zero turnover in our companies. Uh, and uh, it is because they, they feel like they own the business and, and, and uh, they provide that to, to our customers. And that is the most important uh, focus. And uh, I believe that uh, there's some changes now. Everybody else is working there, but I, due to my age, I am not allowed to come to the office. My management decided that they think I'm uh, safer staying in that home and working. So that change has come in. And now we have, we have Zoom meetings. And actually, I find the meetings very, very productive. You have more employees that can uh, interact with them. And all day you are working from morning to evening, no travel time, no lunch time. But what we miss is, and uh, Stephen has said correctly, is face to face with the customer. And that is one thing because the relationships are built uh, on that. Now, right now, we are riding on those past relationships, but hopefully that's something we can open up and we can start doing it. So, but my focus is on the same, and my feeling is that it will, whatever the time frame is, that it, it will come back, the economy, and we all will do as well as we did before, if not better. Very, very positive outlook, Natu. Thank you. Today, so you get the last word. Permanent changes, or are we going back to the way things were? Oh, I think we're going to a hybrid. And I, I um, agree with the others that it's about relationships, um, being aware of what your customers, our members, uh, our users need, being responsive to that, um, offering some flexibility, and increasingly using a number of electronic tools. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us today on this international business panel. Uh, once again, I'd love to thank our panelists, Teresa Sandorowska of ASTM International, Natu Dandora of Custom Chill, and Stephen Miller of Annie International. I really appreciate all of your insights and as I'm sure all of our participants do. So thank you once again. Uh, as executive director for the Temple University's Center for International Business Education and Research, it is a pleasure to, um, to have been able to host this event as the moderator in partnership with the World Trade Center of Greater Philadelphia. Um, and I also wanted to pass along a huge thank you to the WTC president, Linda Conlin, and Graziella Dinuso, their director of communications and development for their tireless work in bringing together this incredible group of panelists and coincidentally, uh, two Fox alumni as well to join us this morning. We at the Fox School and Temple Cyber look forward to continuing our partnership with the World Trade Center of Greater Philadelphia over many years to come and to continue bringing you informative events like this one. I'll now turn it over to Ron Drews, the Assistant Academic Director of International Business Programs here at the Fox School for some final closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin, for serving as our panel moderator this morning and keeping the conversation going here. Uh, just as a recap, this Global Perspectives program was a pivot and actually in addition to what our Global Business Conference was going to be. That was scheduled for March 2020, and uh, because of COVID, it's been moved to March 21, March 2021. 
So um, the Fox School of Business, um, Strategic Management Department and International Business Programs where I work are very good to, uh, very glad to partner with the World Trade Center as um, I know the organization from an inside perspective and it's a great organization to uh, work with and endeavor to bring you these programs. Just for some takeaways, um, China's economy is expected to expand and the world will be watching the progress of this digital market and e-commerce. Jonathan did a great job of kind of explaining where, where the market's at and how to look to address it. Um, China's going to continue to adapt to COVID and still has very positive economic expansion possible, uh, probably more so than other, other parts of the world. Uh, China will have some of the largest digital companies to invest in in the future. And um, their stock market now is the second largest stock market and there are opportunities to use uh, ETFs to participate in this market. And we'll see, of course, what happens with um, trade relations as we go forward. But um, the importance of the two countries' relations are such that uh, they can't be unlinked and it will only continue to grow. Uh, I would like to thank Lindsay Clark on our staff here at um, the Strategic Management Department for putting much of this together and coordinating the internal logistics with it. Uh, Dustin Dellinger and Milk Street Marketing Products, uh, Milk, Milk Street Marketing for producing this event this morning. And I would like to also thank um, Dean James Hansen and his team who helped organize and secure our great keynote speaker, um, Jonathan Shalon. Um, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Crane Shares. So thank you all for the support there. In addition, uh, I'd like to thank our sponsors of the event, which um, include uh, Temple Cyber, the Fox Alumni Relations and Development Office, and Mazars for supporting our event this morning. Uh, we also want to thank you, our audience, um, who remain engaged and those that are in our region for international business and the community here to continue to um, enjoy the programs we put together and be a part of it. Uh, the Fox School has some very interesting upcoming events and we would like to share those with you, our audience, and give you an opportunity to again, join with us and engage our faculty, students, and alumni. So here happening today, at three o'clock, we have the Innovation Leadership Speaker Series hosted by Roseanne, um, or host Roseanne Rosenthal, who is the president and CEO of Ben Franklin Technology Partners of Southeast Eastern PA. And she will discuss how to catalyze a regional innovation ecosystem. Okay, next slide. All right, so on Friday, November 6th, Temple University Entrepreneurship Academy has partnered with organizations across the city and, and internally within the university to host a hackathon on developing solutions for training underskilled individuals towards sustainable incomes. Join us to work with mul multiple multidisciplinary -dis teams to explore the problems, identify solutions, and develop paths forward toward implementation. Uh, entrepreneurship is alive and well at Temple University, and you're invited to watch the lot watch live as 12 finalist teams from across the university, which are comprised of undergraduate, graduate, and alumni teams compete to win part of $6,000 and at the 23rd Annual Innovation Idea Competition, which is Thursday, November 12th. Okay. So we'll have another slide here for our Fox students who are participating they'll be able to scan this QR code for their suitable points now. And in just a little bit, I'll move on so the students can get that taken care of. It's a great audience that we love to serve here at, at Temple University. And then I'll just add that the Fox School is looking forward to continuing uh, our relationship with the World Trade Center of Greater Philadelphia and uh, we'll play host here at the Fox School for the annual Global Business Conference, which is scheduled now again, as I mentioned, for March 2021. Uh, more information will be coming forthcoming on that and can be found at the World Trade Center's website, um, www.wtcphila.org. 
So whether we are in person or in virtual mode, we look to seeing you then. Once again, I would like to thank um, everyone here within the Fox School of Business, uh, all the support we've received from the Dean's Office and the departments, and to again thank our speakers, Jonathan Shalon, Teresa Sandrowska, Nathu Dandora, Stephen Miller, and again, Kevin Vandal for um, facilitating the panel. Thank you again for joining us. This will conclude our Global Perspectives and we look forward to seeing you at our next event. Thank you very much.